You're listening to Parasearch UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio. opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Spirit Dimension with your host, Kerry Greenaway, right here on Parasurge Radio. Good evening and welcome to The Spirit Dimension. My name is Kerry Greenaway, as you all know by now, and I like to bring you something a little bit different on a Sunday evening. And tonight I've got an amazing guest with me who I'll introduce you to in just a second. But first, I'm going to introduce my co-host, Claire Hinks, is with us tonight in the studio again. Good evening, Claire. How are you? Good. more festive. How oh yes, we're all racking up ready for Christmas. No, I have a birthday, it's my son's birthday next week, so I have to wait until that's done before I can put up my decorations. Oh yeah, see, we did that, we did that last Friday, we did a birthday and now I'm Christmassy. <laughs> <laughs> now you're getting into the mood. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to tonight. So am I, because this is a subject that's absolutely fascinated me for quite a long time, in fact two aspects of this lady um, has absolutely fascinated me for a while. Um, the guest I have tonight is, a, is an American lady. Her name is Crystal Reed Hope, and she has done animal communication and also written a book called How to Live with a Psychic. So good evening, Crystal. How are you? Hi, Carrie. Thank you for having me on tonight. I'm fine. Thank you. Oh, you're very, very welcome. As I say, what you do has absolutely fascinated me for a long time because animal communication or being an, a, an animal, animal psychic is sort of a little bit controversial in places, isn't it? Um, most places, it's still controversial. It took me several years to um, be comfortable telling people that I do this. Um, sometimes I wouldn't even mention it to people. I would just mention my other lines of work. But I've gotten to the point where I'm comfortable now talking about it and um, I figure, you know, there are always going to be skeptics and naysayers out there with anything that we do and um, so I just have to tolerate the rolled eyes and the chuckles or whatever, as I'm sure many of us do who work in different psychic fields and healing fields and things like that. Yes, we, I think we, we all know that one, don't we? <laughs> We're all used to that now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and you just go, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm doing yeah. my thing, just doing my thing. Um, yeah. So first of all, how did you wake up to your senses? Because you started in a very, going back to the day, you, you know, you went into the military, you were telling us, before uh, when you just left school or high school in America. Um, so that is is very disciplined and very reality set isn't it it's not really particularly open to like psychic senses or any kind of spirituality um well I would have to say that I as a person was also not open to that stuff at that time so um I think it it would be a really difficult path to walk for someone who was already very open or maybe very empathic I think that would be really rough but I grew up actually being fairly atheistic Um, I didn't, most claims of psychic ability, I didn't believe, uh, most claims of anything that was spiritual or of a religious nature, I didn't believe. Um, so then it wasn't until about my college years when I came back after the military that things started happening. And honestly, I mean, I'm very cerebral. So I took a, um, 
in college, I took a comparative religion class, and I thought I was just taking it to earn academic credits, you know, and check off the box in a certain category. But actually, I really realized um, just on a mental level that I really resonated with the idea of reincarnation, and therefore that's incompatible with pure atheism. And so I started deciding to be more open-minded to things. And once I was willing to be open-minded, a bunch of stuff just started popping up and showing itself to me. So I really, I just had to change my mind. Oh, that's something that's sometimes incredibly hard to do. Yes. Yes. I give, you know, I look back and I think of all my, I'm one unified person, but also I think of myself in different phases of life, almost as different people. And I give 22 year old crystal a lot of credit for being able to make a really definitive change in mindset like that because that that's that's a big big leap to make <laughs> oh huge from yeah <laughs> it is a huge leap to make and it, it like we were talking before the show about how that internal change can affect external relationships won't we yes um you know actually over the years i've lost a few friends who couldn't make that leap with me even to the point where you know we just we sort of didn't have things in common anymore and all that nothing was we didn't go out on bad terms ever but you know you just leave some people behind when things um when your worldviews don't mesh anymore um and then yes also the book that i wrote how to live with a psychic that is about uh specifically not just friendships but when you're in a partnership with a person and um and one person comes into this and the other one hasn't yet and is having trouble dealing with the change, um, change in worldview, change in a person's interests, all those things. Sometimes it feels like it's a different person than you married or a different person than you moved in with or whatever. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, separate because of that. So, But also, though, those changes can happen when you're developed. You know, we all get spiritual changes all of the time don't mean our development changes all of the time so i would go i would say even even when you are developed you're still changing so that can still cause problems can't it in a relationship oh even sure when, even when somebody's aware or, or already aware of what you might be able to do yeah um you know because there are different there are also different levels of this you know there's a a difference between oh, yeah, my um, boyfriend or girlfriend sometimes has these dreams and then they come true later. You know, that's like an easy thing for people to live with or whatever. But then, you know, what if you are atheistic and all of a sudden your husband or wife starts saying, well, you know, I talk to angels when I go to sleep at night. You know, it's like because it keeps yeah. it does. It keeps getting deeper and deeper. And someone who might have been able to go along the ride on the ride with you in the early stages later when you're really really immersed in this lifestyle I mean it might be too much for them at some point but then other people love it and they develop themselves and um, that that's the hope right is that we bring our loved ones with us on this path to greater closeness yeah. to love and all that yeah I think that's amazing what you do you know, that you've written a book to help people with that because that can, you know, particularly what we were saying about, you know, religion in the States is probably quite a bit more he heavier yes. than it is here then. So I think, well done, pat on the back for you for doing that because I expect there are probably more, many more people than we even realise under rocks thinking, oh, I don't know <laughs> what to do. <laughs> yes, yes. And different parts of the country. I mean, in Los Angeles... Um, you can be into just about anything, right? And you can find your people here and you can find acceptance. And a lot, a lot of it has mm -hmm. to do with it's so busy that people aren't worried about they're not in your business, you know. But I know in the smaller towns or whatever, there are people who are under wraps and maybe finding friends online. The Internet is like great for this, you know, mm -hmm. because now you can find a community online without having to come out in your own small town or whatever, Um yeah. Yeah, you're, so, you're never but, alone, are you? You're never alone yeah, now. If right, you've got a computer, right. you're so, you're fine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with that. It's opened up um not just in the spiritual field, but in lots of different fields. You can yes. find somebody online that resonates with you 
um, yeah. whatever that be. And, and that is actually one of the positives in regards to um, social media and the internet. Yes, I agree. And you can find the help you need if you are struggling with a particular pathway as well. You can always find somebody or somebody that's written something that will actually help you. And that that's fantastic. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, these are the things that we would like the internet to be used for, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, one, I would like to go back to animal communication. How did you first realize that you were able to link into animals? Um, okay, it's fairly inauspicious, but I um, we used to have, before the internet here, there was a little catalog where people would tra- um, advertise little classes that they were taking. And so, oh God, it was over 20 years ago, um, someone advertised animal communication. And I've always been a very, very big animal lover. Like, I'm the person at the party that hangs out with the dog instead of other people. You know, that's, <laughs> that's who I am. And um, so someone said animal communication. Now, this was still in my phase where I was still fairly skeptical, but because it was animal related and I didn't have anything to do that night, I figured I would just go and see what this was about. And I went and um, in two hours had really very good success and I was quite surprised myself and I came home and I had a pit bull at the time and so I did an experiment I came in and just in my mind while we were in the bedroom I asked him to turn around in a circle three times and then lay down in a certain position and I made sure it was something that he wouldn't normally do anyway and he looked at me actually he was thinking this in my mind over and over again envisioning it trying to send the message to him he looked at me and he didn't do anything for a minute. And I thought, well, I don't know, either that was just a, some kind of con at this um, class or a fluke because I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's not working. And then I gave it about five minutes and he did what I asked him to do. Cool. Turn around wow. three times. And, went. and I have to say that blew my mind and made me change the way I thought about a lot of things. Um and so now that was still me um, talking to him, right? Mm-hmm. That wasn't like hearing back what he had to say, but that was my first experience of a, like a non-verbal or at least non-allowed, uh, you know, communication. And I found out from him later, he only, uh, when I started being able to talk to him a lot, was um, he had heard me the very first time I said it and the way that I was repeating it over and over again sounded like I was yelling at him, you know? Oh. Um, but... <laughs> That he actually was considering, the, those five minutes were him considering whether he was going to abide by that or not and sort of break down that wall, you know, allow that wall to be broken. Or was he going to pretend to not hear me so that nothing changed? Um, but so he decided to do it. And then, um, and then for a few years with him, I just got to the point where I could talk to him like a person. I mean, literally, like, he was, like, having another roommate. Just the conversation was just sort of, like, that easy flowing and um, constant. Um, And then after doing that with him for a while, then I started trying to do it with other people's animals. And um, I work, actually, better, not in person, but through a photograph. And I know everybody's different with their ability. But um, after... Uh, extensive training with someone in here in LA and then practice on my own. I, um, I don't know if it's just, there's less distraction or what, but I, now I work with my clients, just they email me a photograph online and, um, I do it from there. That's amazing. It's amazing. (laughs) It's almost like remote viewing, isn't it? It's um, extremely like remote viewing and I'm actually active in the remote viewing community here now too. Um, but yeah, I guess it is. I mean, you know, people say, how does it work? Well, there's two versions to that. It's like, how would I literally do it myself? What is my process? But then there's the big picture. How does it work of what are the physics and the mechanics behind it that make this even possible? And it's very similar to remote viewing in that, in that I do think that, um, I don't think that it's just about that our brain is an antenna and we're capturing the the brain waves from the other 
animal or person or whatever. I mean, that might happen some of the time, but I don't think it's limited to that. I think like with remote viewing, we somehow go to that place where everything is one. All of time, space is, and maybe all souls, whatever, are one. And then we're gathering information from that point. So, yeah, it's very similar to remote viewing in that way. So, like, uh, the collective unconscious. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, So, is it just, like, pets you connect with? Is it so, like, your dogs, your cats, your horses? Is it just mainly those? Do they... They obviously have a, their own consciousness. Consciousness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> they obviously have that. But does it transfer more into the wilder animals? Or is it just more um, domesticated? All the, all, no. Um, well, I mean, clearly um, my practice is mostly with pets because nobody's going to pay me to go out and talk to the, you know, whatever grizzly in the woods or whatever. But um no, all of those animals have consciousness. Um, all of those animals actually already use telepathy with each other all the time, which is why I think that an- being an animal psychic is probably easier to learn, for, especially for people who feel a connection to animals strongly, um, than even psychic ability with other humans, uh, certain types of, of psychic ability, because animals are talking to each other telepathically all the time. They're also reading our minds all the time. I mean, the birds outside aren't reading my mind, but my animals are pretty tuned into me all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, they're hearing what I say about myself, about them, whatever, in my mind, right? So the trick is just when do we start listening, right? Um, Because so that flow of information is already there. We're just blocked off. So that's why it's easier. But all the wild animals do this, too. I couldn't go out and I'd talk to squirrels and birds and things like that. And birds are actually kind of funny, especially, I don't know, like seagulls and some of the city birds around here. Um, you know, we consider ourselves, a lot of us consider ourselves sort of some top of the hierarchy of the animal chain or whatever. And... Um, The birds that I've talked to think that we're pretty lame, actually, because we're earthbound. We can't run that fast. You know, I mean, we're we don't swim very well. Just about anything (laughs) in the water could catch us. They really think we're kind of pathetic, you know, and here we are thinking that we're like, I don't know, this grand, you know, we're the pinnacle of evolution or whatever. Animals don't necessarily think that about us. I love that. (laughs) We obviously have a bigger, biggest ego in the world. (laughs) We were walking my dog today. Me and my, me and my son, my daughter, the dog this afternoon. Our dog Penny, and she, and he was saying to me, "Do you think? Do you think the dogs um, can communicate? Like, do you think they have their own language?" Which is really, which is a really funny question to come from him because he's very non. I wouldn't say non spiritual, but he's very black and white. Sure, and. um, he, he and I said, oh, definitely they do. Yeah, they 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 are they speak telepathy to you know telepathically to each right, other. Yes. They have to, you know of course they do. It was like, but it was really funny that we were having this conversation, and then it got me thinking what you were just saying about speaking to your dog and telling him, you know, what to do. And and I was thinking actually when I, I Penny she does there is that there with her because not that I've ever actually tried, but I'm going to after this. <laughs> <laughs> If I'm thinking about taking her for a walk, but I don't say anything, I might be busy putting washing away or cooking tea or whatever, and I'll be thinking, oh, I've got to take the dog for a walk. And all of a sudden, she appears in there, mm-hmm. wherever I am, and she'll sit there and she just, like, I feel her eyes in the back of my head. It's like, uh-huh. did you say, did you say walk? Exactly. <laughs> <Right>. yes. <laughs> so it must be, there is definitely, it's definitely something in it. Always, we've had dogs all my life, and um, my mum has always said the same. I'm sure that dog knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> It's it's so funny because to those of us who have pets, that seems fairly obvious, right? I mean, because it's borne out in our daily experience with them or it's just intuitive to us. And then science is like so slow to accept anything. Like, I mean, it wasn't really mm-hmm. that long ago when they were like, do animals feel emotion? And it's like, who are you people? Like, do you not live on Earth amongst animals? Like, of course they do. You know, why? And I understand that certain people have to get two points in their own way you know and (laughs) they are progressing a little bit but it's just it's funny with if you just interact with animals a lot of this is very clear yeah Mm. yeah 
So do you heal animals or is it just talking to them to find out what their needs are? Uh, I didn't start out doing that. And um, I will have to admit I'm not really strong. That's not one of my strong points. Um, I can do some distance energy work on them. Um, it's more like um, removing discomfort to the, po- uh, to the point of actually like healing a disease or something. Um, I, I make no claim to that. I, it's what I do is sort of on a, uh, a less extreme level with the energy work. But, yeah, I'm working on that. I'm working to improve that all the time. Uh-huh. Yes. So, I mean, I know in your day-to-day life you're studying psychology. Mm-hmm. And you say you work more in an empowerment way, um, which is how I work in a very mental and emotional and empowering way. So it's more of a life coaching kind of scenario yeah. um, in your work, which I resonate with quite closely myself because that's how I do it. Cool. Just use crystals to, to mm-hmm. do that with. Um, have you found that the way you work impacts sometimes... You draw. Oh, how do I explain this? You draw yourself. You draw people to you that need that kind of yeah, like work, yeah. don't you? And, yes. And I found with healers, which is one of the reasons I refuse to go into the healing field, is that a lot of healers end up being ill, quite, mm. quite dramatically yes. Yes. ill because of the way they're working, and it's almost like they don't um, or can't. Is that is that, to... uh, is that lack of protection then? Is that is that their because they haven't protected themselves properly or expelled what they're healing? I think it's because people seem to forget that they're a conduit for energy, not absorb, they're not to absorb the energy, they're just a conduit. So it flows through rather than flows in and stays. Mm. So when you work in an empowerment or an emotional, mental issues, it's exactly the same thing. You have to be that conduit. Is Have you found this within some of the work you've done crystal and are you referring to the way i work with animals or with humans with with whatever you however you work whether it be a human (laughs) or because i would imagine animals have we've already discussed animals have emotions as well so do you find yourself taking on that emotion sometimes and not being able to or haven't released it in the right way at times whether it be animal Uh, or human i um i don't tend to um take on their physical um, issues if I feel something for example if I'm asking them where does it hurt and then say my chest gets really tight like I can't breathe and obviously that's them trying to tell me you know what's going on with them um, I don't hold on to any of that um, and I can't say that it's for any um, really efficient or uh, system that I have for letting go of it I'm just I'm fortunate that I'm not working that way somehow um, but in terms of the um, the emotional issues that animals have I don't keep their and even when I work when I work with people I don't really keep their um, their sorrow or, or pain or anything like that but I do think because like I said I'm very very mental so I do sort of perseverate sometimes on bad situations that an animal or a person is in that I feel very bad that like I can't solve that. I can't fix their life, you know, that Mm -hmm. I have that through my assistance, there's there's a limited amount that I can do. And then for those things to get better, it's that they're um, the parent guardian uh, of the animal or the, you know, the family members of the human or whatever those people also have to change right they have to be willing to change to make these dynamics happen and I can't force that to happen and so yeah I do I mean I tend to think about that stuff quite a lot but I but it's in a mental way and um yeah I do I guess um stress eating because of that (laughs) yes I'm here (laughs) physically but I don't feel it actually like physically in my body I don't feel like I keep stuff in my body Okay, so how on a mental front would you, or can you stop that from happening? Because there's nothing worse than coming up against a situation or whether a a person or an animal and you've done your best to to help but it hasn't been received. So like you say, you ponder on it and you, what could I have done differently? Could I have done anything differently? No, I couldn't. And that impotent feeling of not actually being able to help that person. How do you then find yourself able to let that go? Um... 
Actually, I mean, when I once I realize that I'm doing that, because um, I ascribe to the idea that thoughts and feelings are both just energy, and so I just I have to consciously choose to release the ideas and the emotions, and um, I'm to the point now where I can um, pretty much like viscerally feel emotions or thoughts leave that have been you know stuck in with me or whatever until I feel better. Um, yeah, so it's really just that. It's like going back to that. You were talking about some basics before, and this is a different kind of basic for me. Um, all of these things are just energy. I mean, this table next to me is just energy. <laughs> but that's harder to manipulate. But my own thoughts and and feelings being energy, if I, I can choose to let go of those, and so then I just I work with it that way. Okay. That's very helpful. Claire? Yes. <laughs> I've lost my... You've lost your train of thought, thought, haven't you? I've lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Okay, um, so what's the most common um, issue you find with people? Crystal. Issue that I find with people? Most when common. I'm yeah, the most common issue you keep coming up against. Is it... Uh, I don't know, depression, anxiety, um, I don't know. There's a tremendous amount of that here. I mean, I can only speak to here, you know, and who I work with. There is a lot of depression and anxiety. And um, the depression that I see, a lot of times I help people, <laughs> I direct them back to animals. But, um, you know, I feel like a lot of depression is people say, oh, it's because I don't feel loved. And so I have this theory that that's, only partially correct um that a lot of depression comes from feeling like not that you aren't loved but that what you are trying to offer someone else isn't valued and i feel like that's different right like you've loved someone and they they rejected you and so your love isn't enough what you have to offer isn't enough right and that's a like that's a huge blow now this is of course different than some people who do have actual like chemical depression and things like that. But yeah. when it when it's really, you know, emotionally based. And so, you know, I always directing people back, they have to pick one. Animals, the elderly or children, and they have to go start volunteering. If they can't change jobs, they have to volunteer, and it can't be office work or making phone calls for raising money or whatever. They have to go have hands on um contact with animals the elderly or children because they're going to get immediate appreciation for what they have to offer and um, that's helped most people that I've dealt with who are feeling depressed because they feel like uh, what they well, they don't know why they're feeling depressed but it helps it almost almost always helps because they get because all of those people all of those the animals the elderly and the children give give back unconditionally don't they yes Yes, and immediate, It's right? It's yeah. yeah, they do something and they get this immediate, unconditional, loving feedback. And um, yeah, and they're going to get praise also for how much of a difference they've made for someone else, you know, and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And then that starts to raise their spirit. So um, so that that's a big one. And then also, you know, I just see there's a term I learned in psych school, and you guys might already know this help rejecting complainer there are a lot of people like that who ask for advice but they have no um, intention of actually following anyone's advice they really just want you to listen to their complaints and they want things to be different but they don't want to do anything different <laughs> yeah yeah uh, you know um those aren't my favorite clients obviously because you know uh, i feel like everybody's wasting each other's time but um yeah, and then, I mean, there's increasing, I'll just say it, I'm not going to get too political, but all all mental health professionals here have pretty much found that um, sort of a trauma-like, <sighs> trauma-like symptoms are coming up in a lot of people over the past year in the U.S., and I don't know how much you want to talk about that, but everybody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, um, I mean, I know it's been... Here. I, th I know in, in America it's been incredibly extreme and very difficult times in America. However, I look at it more globally. I think there is a growing unrest 
amongst the populace in most countries, I would say. Well, True. in every country. It's just mm-hmm. we're, fo- we're focusing on America at the moment because it seems to be more louder. Right. At the moment. And that's what's being um, put out in the media, quite frankly. Um, we can't, even in the UK, it's so focused on um, yeah. what's happening yeah. in America. But I actually yeah, think sure. on a global front, the overall energy there is a growing unrest but there's a a massive awakening as well of people going yeah of people going actually I'm not finding this acceptable now it was all right but now I don't actually I've got to re-examine what I think because issues are being brought to the front that are unpalatable um, and people are starting to question themselves even though it doesn't seem it probably on the surface from what we're reading in the media and or seeing on the news and, you know, hearing. But on a day-to-day level, when you're talking to people, I'm finding this in the UK quite a lot, there's a lot more people being a lot more in tune with themselves and actually what is right and what is wrong. I don't know if that's translating over into America. Um, I think it is, and I think, the like you said, there's a sort of an awakening. And I've I've wondered whether that's actually part of the reason things are so tumultuous is because a whole lot of people are sort of like elevating a little bit and the people who aren't ready or don't want that. I mean, it puts more of a distance between us, but also, I don't know, there's just this dynamic of um, the more people get elevated and we're not at the critical mass yet, right? Yeah, no, we're not that point right yet. Now. Yeah, we're not right yeah. quite there yet, are we? But we, <laughs> yeah. it's coming. It is definitely but I think coming. that's actually... No, I do. I think there's this um, positive aspect of the awakening. I think that's contributing to some of the tumult right now um, because of the people who aren't ready for that, you know, and it's just uh, yeah, a divide. Yeah, they're kicking back at it, aren't divide. they? Yeah. Yeah, there's that kicking back action yeah. that's going on with right. it. So you're right, it is causing very tumultuous times. Um, and also I think, oh, I don't want to talk politics, but when you look at history... I think a lot of people are getting worried because they've seen history and they're worried it's going to repeat. And I think we wouldn't allow that to happen again. Uh, I would really, really like to think we wouldn't allow that to happen again. (laughs) But um, I'm sure if you asked people when it happened previously, prior to that, whether that could have happened to them, they would have said no also, you know. So I don't Mm. want to... That's true, actually. uh, yeah. Anyway, let's get off that. Let's get onto something okay. a bit more positive. <laughs> let's get onto more positivity. Right. So, if you, right. when you get a client and they're not, they've lost their way, they don't know what they're doing, um, and you're working in a very, like we said, mental, emotional empowerment kind of way with them, but you're also using your psychic senses to help do that. Um, I mean, I I wouldn't know how not to. Um, I didn't realize when I was younger, how much I sort of was relying that on that and just didn't consider it that, you know, I just thought, Oh, everything that's in my mind is my own unique thought that I came up with. (laughs) I didn't really (laughs) give any credit to even intuition versus a true psychic ability or whatever. But, um, yeah, I do. I mean, sometimes I really need people like they'll ask questions and they want an answer right away. You know, um, and I'll have, you know, I'll be sitting there and I'll, I'll say, okay. And then, um, they'll ask the question again, like, cause I'm not answering quickly enough for their taste, you know? And it's like, no, you have to understand, like, I'm actually like downloading information right now <laughs> about you to give you. Um, because yeah, when I work with people, I don't, um, uh, the time isn't, it's couched more as counseling, not as a psychic reading, you know mm. what I mean? So a lot of people aren't even aware that I'm doing that. Some of, I do a lot of it really low key, whereas um, some people I, I share that with and they appreciate that aspect of it. So it's just on a person by person basis, you know, um, what they're ready to hear and ready to accept uh, about how I'm working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Claire? I, just, I was just thinking, it's just really interesting, isn't it, how how people perceive what we do, I guess, as well. And, like, if people come to you, like, do they come to you as a medium for a reading, specifically? 
not to me. No, that that is not a thing I do. When I'm helping people with coaching, there's two different kinds of things I do. So there's helping couples who need more help with this, like the subject of the book, right? Like this yeah, okay. is cry for how or a person who is on one side or the other of that. So those people obviously expect that to be part of the package. But um, other counseling that I do really is not, a, it's not a mediumship reading or a psychic reading or anything like that. It's really more of a life coaching kind of thing, change of career type of thing, whatever. And they don't necessarily know um, okay. the other kinds of things that I do. And if it becomes relevant and appropriate, then I bring that into it. But I don't, but that's not everyone necessarily comes yeah, because actually, that. really, <laughs> as a medium, like you, people come to me for a reading, and very often it turns into that. You know, I'm do the same. I know what you mean when you say you're downloading the information because you're mm-hmm. kind of get you're kind of getting that stuff for them from whoever, granddad or guide, or yeah. whoever, <laughs> whoever's standing there. Um, most of the only people really that come to me are for for a reading, you know, mediumship reading. But it can it very often turns into like a whole life guidance thing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, sometimes I can't even believe what I'm saying because it's <laughs> because the, and the two are so close, aren't they? They're like, it's really hard sometimes to distinguish. Like, what what are you here? Why are we what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I t- sorry. I, I was yeah, just sorry. having a look at the website and um, Crystal's website, which I've shared into the chat room. Um, for you guys so if you want to check out crystal's books and her work then you can go over to um crystal's you know website which is in the chat room and even if we're even if you're listening back to this you can still access the chat room and find the link um for this so that's not a problem at all you won't lose that now going back to how to live with a psychic this is the book you've written recently and we've we've touched on the impact it can have on a relationship when you develop a skill that wasn't there necessarily before and how destructive it can be incredibly destructive because there's a very it's very threatening to people um because their their partner is changing um in, in an internal way which isn't always um perceived as a positive change isn't that right <coughs> crystal hello Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I heard. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. I heard somebody cough, and then I didn't hear if you had a question oh, for me. Oh, that was I didn't me. I'm that. sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was just saying how we're going back to how to live with the psychic, and how when you very first start um, awakening, I suppose is the expression, how that can be perceived as quite destructive. Right, um, which is unfortunate, but... Um, yeah, it can, and it doesn't even have to be so much on a philosophical or spiritual level that it's a problem all the time. It can just be that, um, you know, a lot of people when they're first awakening, their attention shifts significantly, right? I know with Brett, um, he tends to be sort of obsessive with things anyway, but once um, stuff came on really strongly with him, Like, that's all he wanted to watch TV about, all he, you know, uh, he wanted to read every book about that. All his free time, he was researching and practicing and learning, you know, and that's not what we were doing before. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, and um, our life, I don't know, I'm flexible enough, our life is flexible enough that I could allow him that period of time and then also see that I could learn some from him while he's going through it and all that kind of stuff. But um, not everybody's lifestyle is set up for that, for someone to be sort of that obsessive compulsive on one, one thing or, um, you know, um, another example, it's a really easy example. When someone um, becomes very empathic, suddenly um, crowded places, right? Like movie mm. theaters, the opera house, um, some kind of, carnival whatever those places until they get their empathic ability under control are really uncomfortable Mm. um dog pounds i don't know how you guys if you guys have public 
places where dogs on the street are taken to a pound waiting to be adopted or whatever. Those places are like really traumatic for somebody who's very empathic if they don't have their um, abilities worked out yet. And so, um, you know, a person might have to stop going to places that the couple has gone to together traditionally and then Joy's going together, you know? And so, yeah, it might not even be that the partner has any problem with the spiritual or metaphysical aspect of this, but it really it can disrupt at least temporarily until things get under control, even just their daily life together. Mm. And um, in the people that I've seen, that's more of an issue than the philosophical side of it. I mean, here in L.A., like I said, everybody's pretty open-minded, whatever, anyway. But it's the it's the disruption to the daily routine. Like, this isn't what I signed up for. We've built this whole life together, and now you're like a different person, all this stuff you're doing, you know? Um, so, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that the other person, we, always, we almost always look at the psychic like, oh, my God, look at what they're going through, you know? But it's like the other person has a lot of adapting to do. Mm. yeah i agree with that particularly like yeah. you say, when it steps up a level it can be incredibly difficult to um change at the same speed as the other know. person we always realize that we're i'm sure when i change i go through a bit of a change it's probably shut down a bit in mm-hmm. with my family okay. i probably withdraw a little bit and kind of and can where they say, yeah, the room's full of dead people, I can't cope anymore. Uh. <laughs> and he goes, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then it you're is, talking you know, about... It's, it's a big adjustment yeah. for everyone. Yeah, and it affects sleeping patterns and everything, right? I mean, it really, it does touch almost everything. Yeah. And I think sometimes yeah. if you're so caught up in your day-to-day life, you might be going through this awakening, but you've got you've still got your normal life going on. It is actually at night when all that's done, everyone's settled down, everyone's sleeping, and you're like, ping, oh, my God, mm-hmm. now, yeah. they're, now they're stepping in and wanting me to do stuff, and I'm absolutely exhausted, and I can't deal with this. And your partner's going, why are you rolling around in bed? Don't get up right. or whatever. And it's, <laughs> those, you know, it's, it's those things that are really difficult to cope with. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, yeah, so I have chapters on um, how to deal with that stuff. and then, I, But I also have a chapter, you know, on taking care of yourself because I realized through so much of the book it's like do this, do this, do that. But it's all like just sort of compensating for what the other person is doing. But so I try to then focus on the person and say like, well, you know, it's not just about your partner. It's, you know, you are the the protagonist of your own life story of course you know I mean you have to take care of yourself and you don't just have to uh acquiesce and adapt to everything they're doing like do a bunch of stuff for yourself too but um Mm -hmm. yeah it's um it's a balance but I mean in certain ways if you uh, couples who can handle the um the spiritual aspect of this change then it's not that much different maybe than like someone losing a job or a first pregnancy or a any other thing that's majorly life changing that you'll have to get through together, mm-hmm. you know it's yeah um, yeah but but um yeah if a partner's also having problems with the the spiritual aspect or keeping up with that then yeah that's a whole other level of issues they're gonna have. <laughs> oh yeah certainly it is now going on to self care because you you touched on self care. There are so many things you can do to help yourself through this process, aren't there? Yeah, and um, mostly I just feel like people need to keep doing what they want to do. That's the most important thing. But that's sort of general relationship advice is to not let yourself get lost into the other person so much that you become unrecognizable or develop any resentment to them. You know, I mean, I think successful couples really sort of, as as bonded as they are, they still maintain sort of the importance of each one as an individual. Um, so that's one of the things that I think is really important. Um, and of course, I, one of the other things that's really important is to stay grounded, isn't it? Yes. You know, that, and because the real, the real world, the physical world and what's going on 
in our day-to-day lives is what keeps us real, isn't it? Yes, yes, exactly. And um, healthy yeah, balance. I mean, yes, yes, that's one of the things that actually I mentioned in the book a little bit more about helping the other person do, but absolutely it, it relates to the the non-psychic partner, if there is such a thing, because we know eventually everybody's going to be, right? But um, for the non I <laughs> mentioned, yeah, <laughs> help keep them grounded, uh, focused on the kids, the house, I don't know, going to the gym, their job, connecting with their family, whatever, super important stuff. Yeah. Um, In fact, that's more important than people realize. And I think... When you felt like we've, you know, when you first hit your awakening and you, you were trying to like learn it and encompass it and bring it into your world and, you know, that balance sometimes goes and people then find the more day to day stuff actually quite, um, what's the word, interferes. You know what I mean? Yes. You, you kind of <laughs> right. get a bit bored yeah. with that. You get, oh, yes. God, I've got to take the kids to the club. But I actually want to be doing this yeah. because this is this is where my attention wants to be. It's really hard right. sometimes to switch your focus between the two. And that's yeah. actually a really incredible tool that you need to learn very early on is that you have to have your set times where you are able to focus completely on that spiritual awakening. And like you say, switch it off and actually go and do the dinner or sort the kids yeah. homework out or you know watch a crappy movie with your partner right. <laughs> yeah. you know you might be sitting there Absolutely. through the whole movie going oh god I could rather be doing so and so but <laughs> you you go it's important that you have that time together and experience whatever that situation is together and then go yeah. off and do what you want to do yes as well yeah do you know what I mean that is but then I think that's not just to do with spiritual that's actually quite a useful relationship tool <laughs> right yeah I agree I'd yes. agree <laughs> yeah I totally agree you, everyone needs their time um to do what they want to do within a relationship it's it's quite important and you know not just for our own sanity but uh when I was younger I hadn't figured this out yet fortunately I have you know people fall in love with us for a certain reason they fall in love with us as like an individual that had certain interests and talents and quirks and all this kind of stuff. And then we so often in a relationship sort of, um, I don't, uh, we give up so much of ourself, you know, and some of that is necessary. Obviously you're getting married, you're having kids, you have a joint life together or whatever. But I think some people go too far and they sort of lose even the parts of themselves that made the other person fall in love with them in the first place. Yeah. You know, because people Mm. didn't fall in love with you as, uh, I mean, if it's a healthy relationship, they didn't fall in love with you as like, oh, what a great extension of myself this person would be, right? They liked you mm. for you. Yeah. Like, don't, yeah. you know, don't lose that. Yeah. I, f- I think that's really, really important. I think that is yeah. actually a real problem in today's society in regards to relationships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe it always has been I don't know (laughs) unrealistic expectations I feel (laughs) (laughs) anyway um moving on swiftly (laughs) Um, can I can I take the the attention back to the animal communication yeah um so because I was just having a little read of what you've written on your website which is so interesting actually and it and you you say about how you know that um, working through through a photograph with the animal. So is that like that? Obviously, is telepathy. Is that like I mean, when I do a reading for somebody um, over I don't know over the phone or over the internet or something like that. I obviously, have that I have their person with me and stuff. How does it work when you're communicating with an animal? Do you just how do you know that you've linked in with that animal that you're seeing the photograph of? Um, okay, well, that's sort of really like the trick of all this psychic stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Unless you have somebody there who can sort of validate exactly what you're saying, you have to learn how to what yeah. to trust and everything. Um, okay, so my process, though, is I get this um, photograph. For some reason, it matters that the animal is looking at the camera in the photograph, so I feel like I'm making eye contact. That's all probably on some level totally unnecessary but in my brain that's necessary so that's what I need so I look and then um I just I get 
you know, I don't need to do too much of a prep anymore, like a meditation or anything like that. It, after a while, as you guys know, you can sort of like turn it on a lot quicker than, you know, yeah. when you're busy. Yeah. And then I just start asking questions. And I usually start with, uh, you know, telling them my name, uh, saying their name, introducing myself, saying uh, whatever the people's uh, call themselves. Oh, are they mommy and daddy or are they you know, Lisa and Douglas or whatever, you know, asked me to talk to you and whatever. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? And then I just wait until I get answers. I start getting answers. And I know that wasn't your question. Your question was, but how do I know that I'm actually talking to the animal and not somebody else? Um, I guess I, I can answer my own question by saying, how do I know that I'm speaking to uh, Jane's <laughs> granny? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you just, after practice, sort of, you know, and one thing that um, helps me, though, is when the language is coming through in, like, words or phrases that I wouldn't use. If it sounds exactly like me just talking to myself and answering my own questions, I'm going to sit there and say, you know, maybe I'm not really tuned in yet. Let's, like, get into this a little bit deeper. But um, very often the animals come back with the strong resonation of a personality uh, through the words and the the images they're giving me and all that, and then I just have to trust that I'm giving getting that and yeah. go with it. Yeah. Awesome. That's fascinating. But so I, sometimes I'm really surprised by animals' vocabulary, and I think um, like I had a just um, two days ago I had a cat who was cussing, and I don't get that very often. You know, <laughs> that makes me kind of laugh. I love I that a cussing that, cat. <laughs> <laughs> but I imagine that you know they're picking up on their what their people you know how their people communicate and use language and respond to situations and things um and then some of them use really fancy words and some of them are really i mean not dogs so much i hate to say that but like horses a lot of times are like really very wise um uh the breed specific things is like German shepherds usually won't talk to me unless their people have given them permission to talk to me. Whereas other breeds will just start talking because they're eager that somebody's listening. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's very, it's very interesting. And every animal just sort of feels different when they come through that. That's sort of the best I can answer that. Okay. Are animals spiritual? Um, uh, they're certainly not religious, but you already would know that. Um, are they spiritual? Some of them, the best I can say is that some of them are aware that they're a spirit. They're aware of their past lives. They're aware of the process of going and coming. Um, I've never had an animal refer to any kind of deity. Um, I've never... Um, so I don't know. I feel like, like, especially cats are thought to sort of dip in and out of this dimension and go into the spirit dimension quite a bit. Um, and I've had animals who, when they pass on, if someone has me try to check on where the animals are in their, um, you know, transition process, some of them don't know yet because it doesn't really feel that different to them. So I think they relate to their bodies. A lot of species at least relate to their bodies somewhat differently than we do okay. but in terms of spirituality of like having a codified set of beliefs about what spirit is i haven't really had animals discuss that with me okay. animals are really aware though aren't they yes really aware of, of energy spirit energy yes, yes. and when you so, have yeah. ghosts in the house or whatever they totally yeah. see that like there's somebody there even though a lot of humans yeah. can't tell ever. Yeah. I have a cat who is who she doesn't particularly like fuss unless it's on her terms. And um <laughs> <A> cat. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Typical cat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got another cat that just is in your face all the time, but Moggy's very like I'm just sitting here, don't touch me unless I ask you to. Because if you touch me, I'm Love just going to leave with my tail in the air. <laughs> when I, I when I do readings for people, well, I don't, I don't even know where she comes from. She might not even be in the house, but she will appear and she harasses the person for the whole for the whole forty minutes. <laughs> she will lie and let her belly be. Right. If I touch her belly, she attacks me. <laughs> she will literally lie with her legs in the air the whole time that I'm wow. doing this reading. 
and it's bizarre and I said and I say it must be I'm sure it's because she's connected somehow yeah yeah so how do what do I do if I want to talk to my cat about it <laughs> how do I about that? So well I'll... you're you're already used to receiving information in this same manner right yes. but it's just spirit guides and people who passed on and such so I would say just be in the same frame of mind and ask your crat a question and trust the answer. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's that. That simple. Yeah. Oh, so God, when I'm I had, excited. I know. When I had my <laughs> cat, oh, it was like an absolute rogue cat. It would never be in the house. It always wanted to be out with its posse and getting into trouble, no doubt. But when I was, whenever I was in my crystal room, it would always come into my room and sleep on a crystal. And I'd be like, how is that comfortable? It can't be comfortable <laughs> with your head on this crystal. Um, but yeah. every time, every single time I was working out there, I wouldn't go in there normally if I wasn't out there. And as okay. I say, this was like not the most affectionate cat in the world as they preferred to be out and about rather than in the house. But if it was in the house and I was working crystals... It would be in the crystal room and it would be curled up next to a crystal asleep with its head on, particularly on my quartz cluster. Its head would be on the quartz cluster and it just sort of like yeah. look at me through one eye occasionally as it's like, go on then, keep going. Uh, <laughs> it's energy, isn't it? Cats are so connected. Yeah. They are. Soaking they are. that up. Yeah. 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 Whereas my dog obviously follows me around like a loyal little soldier that he is. And so if I'm in there and nine times out of ten, he'll be tripping me over. If I'm working, I'm right. like, for God's <laughs> sakes, will you move out the way? I'm like, it's going to tread on you and hurt you in a minute. <laughs> and he sort of just gives Different me a reproachful, thoughts, yeah, reproachful yeah. look as if so you should be fussing me and not actually doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Constantly. It's an absolutely fascinating topic, isn't it? I mean, what's the strangest communication you've had with an animal? <laughs> um, okay, so... I'm actually starting on a book about animal communication and I'm going to have a chapter that's entitled something like not always a dog soul in a dog body okay. and not always a dog soul in a dog body. So um, what really uh, is the most interesting to me, I don't know how, what other com communicators would think was most interesting, but it's when I talk to an animal and the issues that they're having is because in the past they're more likely that they've been other types of animals before instead of a dog, for example. So an example I can use is one who had previously been a, um, like a dairy cow on a nice rural farm. And it always seen um, people going in the house and the dogs got to go in the house with the people. So it decided that in the future it wanted to reincarnate into a dog body so that it could have this cushy life of going in the house and all that and it was the the problem was like the dog just seemed sort of like paralyzed with fear or whatever and uh come to find out it felt this is what it said what i said sometimes the words it's you know you're talking to somebody else because of the way they say words said mm -hmm. being a dog is a lot of responsibility that's what oh, this yeah. dog told me and so i was like what the heck are you talking about so we talked about how it had always been a cow before and a cow just has to stand out in the field and chew its cud and, you know, whatever. And being a dog, they're like you were just talking about, your dog is always under your feet and follows you around like a little soldier. There's certain sort of like interaction with humans expected from a dog. And it's a very sort of energetically intense relationship we have in this dog was just overwhelmed because it had never been a dog before and didn't know how to be a dog. Um, so those are the kinds of things that are the most interesting to me. I mean, I get most of my clients, of course, it's just behavior things and it's miscommunications or it smells in the house or it's, you know, whatever. It's like things that we can fix. But it's the stuff where it's about either past life stuff or soul level stuff like that. that that's I love those. Those are my favorite. Yeah. Favorite oh, it well. made me feel so sort of. Oh, the cow. <laughs> yeah. I know. How cute. And we've actually come to the end of the show. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Crystal. It's been an absolute pleasure to yeah, have you. Yeah, this was really fun. 
Thank you. Thank yeah, you. and to talk <laughs> about all different aspects, not just animal communication, but, you know, relationship um, and the effect spiritualism and awakening can have on that. Like I said, I've shared your website into the chat room. People can access that even when it's gone to a podcast. So, guys, don't forget about that. So, thank you so much for joining me again. Um, now, tomorrow, yeah, Monday, we have got the Parasearch UK Radio Encore Show. This week, we um, discussed what relevance mediums have in the paranormal field. That was very, very interesting. On Tuesday, the Paranormal Concept Show, we're looking at competition in the paranormal field. Um, So that's always going to be an interesting discussion. On Wednesday, the Haunted History Show, um, Penny is joined by Richard Eastip, who we adore here on Parasite. And they're talking about Asylum 49. On Thursday, we've got the KTPF Reload Show. And on Friday night, we're actually talking about Camp Hope, which was the inspiration for the absolute blockbuster smash hit Stranger Things, the conspiracy and the myths regarding that particular um, incident. (laughs) I do love a conspiracy theory. Next Sunday, I'm joined by Mr. Andy Mercer into the studio and we're talking about John Dee, the philosopher and occultist from the 16th century. And on that note, I'm going to bid you all a very farewell. Good night. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Crystal, for joining us. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And I'll see you all very, very soon. Take care. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.